Welcome back to Crime Pod. This episode is going to be all about Crippin. In 1893, Hawley Harvey Crippin married his second wife, Cora Turner, in Jersey City, America. Seven years later, in 1900, they moved to London. He was employed as a representative for Munyon's Remedies, a company making homeopathic remedies, while Cora, using the name Belle Elmore, had aspirations to be a music hall artist. Unfortunately, Belle had no talent whatsoever. In fact, neither Belle nor Cora was the real name of Mrs Crippin. She'd been born Kunigund Makamotsky and was the daughter of a Russian Polish father and German mother. She was also a most overbearing and dominant character. Her long-suffering husband supported her ambitions to be first an opera singer and then when that didn't work out, a singer in the music hall. But she had very little success. All she did manage to get out of her career was a few show business friends and the position of treasurer of the Music Hall Ladies Guild in London. In September 1905, Dr Crippin and his wife took a lease on 39 Hilldrop Crescent in Holloway. Part of the thinking behind this move was that the pair could now have separate bedrooms. Belle had never really been a sexual person and according to what Crippin would later say, all physical relations between them ceased in 1907. Crippin, meanwhile, had fallen in love. The object of his desire was Ethel Lenev, a typist, to work for him. At about the same time that Crippin stopped having sex with Belle, he and Ethel became lovers. This situation continued until 1910. On the evening of Monday, the 31st of January 1910, the Crippins threw a dinner party for two close friends of Bell's, Paul and Clara Martinetti. The meal passed pleasantly enough, except for one incident. Paul Martinetti had asked to use the toilet, and because Crippin didn't escort him upstairs to show him where it was, Bell berated him. By the time the Martinettis finally left, it was around 1am on Monday the 1st of February. It would be the last time that anyone saw Bell Elmore alive. Over the next week or so, people began to ask where Belle was. Crippin said that she'd gone to America. As the days passed, this story was amended, and now she'd fallen ill. Finally, Crippin told people that his wife had passed away. There was, however, one problem with this. Ethel Nenev had started wearing some of Belle's jewellery, and by the end of February, she'd moved in with Crippin at Hilldrop Crescent. Friends grew suspicious and in due course those suspicions were passed on to the police. On the 8th of July, Chief Inspector Walter Dew called at Hilldrop Crescent where he found Ethel alone. Crippin, it seems, was at work. So Dew visited him there and the two returned together to Hilldrop Crescent where Crippin happily showed the officer around the house. He also told Dew a different story. Bell had left him for another man almost certainly Bruce Miller, an American she'd met in late 1903. Dew told Crippin that it would be better if Bell contacted him to confirm this story and Crippin said that he'd place an advertisement in certain newspapers asking for her to make contact. Things now move very quickly. The next day, the 9th of July, Crippin shaved off his distinctive moustache and with Ethel Lenev disguised as a boy, travelled to Brussels. There they bought tickets for passage to Canada, travelled on to Antwerp and there boarded the SS Montrose, travelling as father and son. At about the same time, Chief Inspector Dew returned to Hilldrop Crescent. He was surprised to find Crippin and Ethel missing and decided to make another routine search of the house. In the cellar, he noticed some loose bricks in the floor. Officers were ordered to make a more thorough search and beneath those bricks, they found the remains of a body. The body was headless, limbless and boneless, little more than pieces of flesh, but it was female. It was time to find Crippin. Aboard the Montrose, the father and son were watched with interest. They seemed to be unduly affectionate and were constantly holding hands. Added to that, the boy's clothing seemed to be very ill-fitting. 
Captain Kendall had his suspicions and telegraphed a message to Scotland Yard. Do, now determined to intercept that the father and son, boarded a faster ship, the SS Laurentic, and the hunt was on. On Sunday, the 31st of July, Do and other officers boarded the Montrose as it sailed up the St Lawrence. The father and son were identified as Crippin and Adam Lenev. Both were arrested and, after three weeks, were escorted back to England to face trial. It was decided that the pair should not be tried together. Crippin would face his trial first, and once that verdict had been determined, Ethel Lenev would take her turn in the dock to be tried as an accessory. So it was that on the 18th of October, Crippin stood alone in the dock at the Old Bailey before the Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Alverstone. The proceedings would last until the 22nd of October. Crippin's defence was simple. The body found in the cellar of his home was not Bell's. The body must have been some poor unknown woman that had been placed there before he and Bell had moved in. It was, therefore, crucial to the prosecution to prove that the body was Bell's. One piece of the flesh found in the shallow grave had borne a scar. A medical record showed that Bell had such a scar on her lower abdomen. More conclusive was the fact that the remains had been wrapped in a pyjama jacket, and a tag inside that jacket led to the manufacturers, Jones Brothers. They confirmed that this particular cloth and pattern were not used until late 1908, proving that the body must have been placed there after that date. This and the scar was consistent with the body being that of Bell Elmore. Medical tests had shown that the flesh contained traces of hyacinth, a poison, and it was known that Crippen had purchased five grains of that substance on the 17th of January, two weeks before Bell had vanished. It was enough for the jury, who took just under 30 minutes to find Crippen guilty of his wife's murder. On the 25th of October, Ethel Lenev was put on trial as an accessory to murder and found not guilty. A subsequent appeal on behalf of Crippen was dismissed and his death sentence was confirmed. On Wednesday, the 23rd of November, 1910, 48-year-old Crippen was hanged at Penterville by John Ellis and William Willis. Crippen's last request had been for a photograph of Ethel and some of her letters to be buried with him in his unmarked grave. The request was granted.